Jesus. Um, I only met Jenny Hayward Jones just a couple of weeks ago when we met to talk about this event. Uh, but having had a long interest in Fiji and a posting in Fiji, and more latterly uh, visiting there uh, in my role as Director of International Affairs in the Commonwealth Secretariat, and also as a visiting teacher at the University of Fiji, uh, my interest is maintained, keeps being renewed. And I came to know and respect Jenny as uh, her name and her work, never having met her, as a dispassionate and objective observer and commentator on Fiji and the region. And as you know, she's been introduced as uh, the, uh, in her current capacity with the Lao Institute. Uh, her subject today is very relevant. All Fiji and South Pacific watchers are looking keenly to see what Julie Bishop's next steps are going to be in Fiji and the region. And after years of standing on principle, the Australian Government, the Commonwealth, the Pacific Islands Forum have all lost ground and they've lost ground to new and abounding influences from elsewhere in the region. And so it's going to be of particular importance how the Fiji now proceeds after having its election in September uh, last year a decisive turning point. And uh, so we've been looking forward to Jenny's address. And would you please welcome Jenny Hayward-Jones to speak to us about post-election Fiji and its place in the world. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Hugh, and, and thank you, Cameron. And I'd like to extend a, a special thanks um, not only to the AIAA, but also the Commonwealth Roundtable for not only inviting me, but um, choosing a focus on Fiji this week. Um, as Hugh said, I think it's very timely um, and it is important in Australia that we do um, continue to focus on what is happening in our, our nearest neighbours. Um, I'm going to talk today um, about post-election Fiji and its place in the world, um, including in the Commonwealth, in the region um, and in its relationship with Australia. But I'll, firstly, I'll devote a little bit of time to the elections context, um, just so that um, you're all on the same page with that. So last year, Septem uh, 17 September, uh, Fiji held national elections for the country's parliament um, for the first time in eight years. Fiji's previously democratically elected government, led by uh, Lysenia Ngarase, was overthrown in a military coup in 2006, as I'm sure you all know. The eight years between the coup and the elections were a period of quite dramatic change in Fijian governance practices, in foreign policy and in national identity. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Bainarama, um, of course he was Commodore Bainarama before taking that position, uh, running government effectively in a cabinet of two with his Attorney General, the government ruled by decree, abrogated and later replaced the constitution censored the media, compromised the judiciary, and sidelined the traditionally powerful institutions in Fiji society, such as the Great Council of Chiefs and the Methodist Church. In 2009, when the Fiji High Court found that uh, Bainarama's assumption of power in the coup was unconstitutional and therefore illegal, um, following that the constitution was abrogated by the president, um, the judi judiciary was sacked, um, extensive public emergency regulations were imposed, um, and Bainarama was installed um, more or less as the permanent Prime Minister. A bit more about the elections. Uh, the elections represented an incredibly important step towards a renewed commitment to democracy and the rule of law. They were highly anticipated, not only in Fiji, but also here, um, in New Zealand and in Fiji's other Western partners, which had been putting pressure on the Fiji government to hold elections for many years. Bainarama had announced in late 2009 that Fiji would introduce a new constitution in 2013 and hold elections in 2014. But the Fiji government was quite slow to take actions along the way to give uh, any encouragement to the international community that th this was definitely going to happen. There were, however, encouraging steps taken in 2012 when uh, the regime announced it was um, developing a new constitution and would appoint a uh, constitutional Yash Gai to head a new constitutional commission, which would then carry out a public uh, process of public consultation. Um, this is very encouraging. Everyone got to, to have a say. There's a lot of public discussion about what the new constitution would look like um, and a great deal of confidence about the future. Unfortunately, uh, Bainarama didn't really like the constitution that he was presented with from the constitutional commission um, and uh, somewhat later produced its own constitution. 
Now, although there was some disappointment about the way it was introduced, the constitution itself was judged by a number of international uh, constitutional experts to be a reasonable document, albeit with some flaws. Importantly, for the elections, it provided for a single chamber 50 member parliament to be elected on the basis of one person, one vote, using proportional representation um, drawn from one national constituency. So it's very new for Fiji and also not that common um, in the world. There are a few other countries that use it. Um, so it was quite quite a, a shock, I guess, for, for Fiji voters to, to come up with this new, new system. The constitution also mandated that elections must be held every four years and stipulated the first elections um, must be held by September 2014. Another new initiative was that every Fijian over 18 was qualified to vote, so the voting age was lowered, um, meaning that many more young people um, were suddenly first-time voters. The Prime Minister resigned as commander of Fiji's military in March uh, last year, formed a new political party called Fiji First, and set about recrafting his image as a democratic contender. Um, very encouragingly, seven political parties and two independent candidates registered for the elections. Um, and a number of these parties framed their campaigns around the platform of the return of democracy um, and championing rights such as media freedom. However, the issues that ultimately held the most relevance to ordinary Fijians, um, just as in many countries, were jobs, infrastructure, development, um, cost of living and land ownership. Fiji First campaigned very heavily on its core issues, um, was widely regarded before the elections as the favourite. Um, they drew their candidates largely from serving cabinet ministers, government <coughs> officials, people in business. Um, they, were, they had an advantage in that they, they had, I guess, access to the country's media. Um, they'd been governing um, solely for, for many years and had a number of achievements that they could sell. So they were definitely able to benefit from not only incumbency but very high visibility that Bainarama had as, as the Prime Minister for so many years. Um, on the day, uh, voters uh, came to the, the polls and voted on a very strange looking ballot paper, it looks like a Sudoku paper. Um, for one candidate, um, so just w and one number, so there were no names and no photos. In this vote, uh, the Prime Minister attracted a very high personal vote, 202,459 to be precise. Um, in Fiji First, out of this, won 59.2% of the overall vote. Um, the next highest personal vote went to the Sodopa leader, Road to Memu Kepu. Uh, with 49,485 votes um, and once the votes for all candidates were converted into seats um, using a very complicated formula I'm not even going to attempt to explain to you, I'm not sure I understand it myself. Um, Fiji first won 32 seats, Sodopa won 15. Um, Sodopa is the, the heir to the party that governed Fiji before the coup. And the National Federation Party uh, won the remaining three seats. The most important outcome of these elections, apart from the, the return to democracy, um, may have been that this marked the end of elections in Fiji being decided along ethnic lines. So the 2014 outcome was the first election in Fiji's history of independence in which voting patterns have transcended the traditional ethnic lines between indigenous or Itakai Fijians and Indo-Fijians. Now, of course, we can't really prove this trend until the next election, um, but it does seem likely that more parties in the future um, will need to run pan-ethnic campaigns um, following the experience of this, this election. There was a multinational observer group in place, co-led by Australia, India and Indonesia. Um, it also included observers from some 15 countries. Their report following the elections noted that despite compressed timeframes, a complex voting system and some restrictions in the electoral environment, the conditions were in place for Fijians to exercise their vote freely. So even though there were um, some irregularities noted by the opposition parties, um, these were judged to be um, not substantial enough to have influenced the electoral outcome. So put simply, the 2014 elections uh, can be regarded, and certainly were regarded then, as both free enough and fair enough um, to be democratic. And Bainarama has now, of course, uh, won legitimacy as the democratically elected leader of Fiji. Uh, turning to relations with Australia and, and indeed the world. Um, Australia and Fiji have a very extensive history of trade, investment and people-to-people -people links. More than 50,000 Fijians live and work in, in Australia and um, up to 350,000 Australians visit Fiji every year. Um, or I'm sure know it as a very popular holiday destination. 
Australia is Fiji's key trading and commercial partner in the region, uh, with goods and services trade worth approximately $1.6 billion and Australian investment stock almost $1.7 billion. Um, Fiji, Australia is also currently the um, Fiji's second largest bilateral aid donor. The two countries have traditionally worked closely um, in the Pacific Islands Forum. I think there are a number of uh, former officials here today who will be familiar with that, um, including him. This close relationship was occasionally disturbed um, by a couple of coups in the past, but has, has otherwise been friendly. But it was the Banyarama coup in 2006 which, mostly, which most significantly altered the dynamics of bilateral relations, as well as Fiji's position within the broader international community. So I'm sure most of you remember, following the 2000 coup, following the 2000 coup, and sorry, 2006 coup, Australia and New Zealand suspended their defence cooperation programs with Fiji, cut some parts of the aid program, um, and imposed travel sanctions on the Fiji military and members of the interim government. The United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, and several Pacific Island states also applied uh, similar measures um, in, in a number of different ways in order to pressure Bainarama to hold early elections and restore democracy. The suspension of defence cooperation and imposition of travel sanctions uh, from Australia annoyed Bainarama but did not induce any early movement towards holding elections. In March 2007, the Pacific Islands Forum extracted a commitment from the regime to hold elections within the next two years. When Bainarama did not meet the deadline um, in 2009 and instead abrogated the constitution, Fiji was suspended from membership of the Pacific Islands Forum um, and also from the Commonwealth of Nations on the basis that it had violated the 1991 Harare Declaration. So the response of Fiji's traditional Western partners to the coup and its suspension from both organisations, the Forum and the Commonwealth, um, prompted a very dramatic change in Fiji's foreign policy outlook. Fiji launched a series of efforts to expand its diplomatic network beyond the region and into definitely non-traditional diplomatic territory, forming some between 60 and 70 new diplomatic relationships in quite a short period of time. In fact, I think hardly a month has gone by in the, in the last few years without the Fiji government announced it had formed a new diplomatic relationship with a, a country in Africa and the Caribbean, Gulf states, Eastern European countries. It's almost impossible to keep track. The effort and expense of these activities has been extensive, which has also put a lot of pressure on the Fiji Foreign Ministry. To its credit, however, the Banyarama government prioritised improving governments with emerging economies, such as Indonesia, Brazil and South Africa. And although there is much more work to be done in broadening and deepening these relationships, it is important for a country of Fiji's size that it engages with countries like these. The Bainarama government also worked on establishing and strengthening relationships with China and Russia, forging new military and technology deals with both states. In fact, between 2006 and 2014, China became Fiji's largest aid donor. Um, this is a result of new research uh, my colleague Philippa Brandt has done, which proves that China gave um, approximately 340 US million US dollars um, compared to Australia's $252 million over that period. This is not on an annual basis, it was over the period of 2006 to 14. China became an increasingly important investor in Fiji and indeed seems to be the only country investing in Fiji um, in the period following the coup. The benefits to Fiji of a deeper relationship with Russia is less clear. There's certainly a lot of activity going on, um, quite a number of MOUs have been signed but um, we're not yet seeing the, really the outcomes of that of increased Russian influence in Fiji yet. Over this time, Fiji seemed determined to prove it did not need Australia or New Zealand, um, despite a significant proportion of the Fiji economy still dependent on trade, investment and tourism from Australia and down over New Zealand. Fiji joined the Non-Aligned Movement and in 2013 shared the G77 plus China group um, and used its chairmanship um, wisely um, to emphasise the issues important to small island states. From 2011 to 2013, Fiji chaired the Melanesian Spearhead Group um, and used that time to promote Fiji's policy priorities. Now this generated some controversy and a little bit of uh, tension um, with Vanuatu, um, which was not quite happy about the direction Fiji was taking it in promoting uh, a relationship with Indonesia. In fact, Indonesia gained observer status within the Malaysian Spearhead Group um, at this time and um, some other countries in the region thought that this was at the expense of West Papuan interests. Fiji's chairmanship over this time, of course, saw um, 
it coincided with Fiji's interest in strengthening its own ties to, to Indonesia. I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, the Fiji military, um, the largest defence force in the region, um, 3,200 personnel serving in active forces. Fijian troops have often proved integral to peacekeeping operations within the region, contributing troops and police personnel to the Regional Truce and Peace Monitoring Mission in Bougainville, and the military contingent of the Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands, and in interna international missions in Timor-Leste beginning in 1999. Of course, it also participates in many UN peacekeeping missions, um, which is an important mark of prestige for Fiji internationally. It's also a very useful source of revenue for the Fiji government and a valuable source of remittances for the soldiers of Fiji fam families of Fiji soldiers. A total of um, 1,040 Fijian soldiers are currently deployed in Iraq, Egypt and the Golan Heights, um, and some 25,000 mm. soldiers in total um, over the years have served in UN peacekeeping missions, just to give you a flavour of how significant this is for Fiji. So after Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the United States um, suspended all forms of defence cooperation following the coup, Bainarama sought to form military ties with other security partners in order to maintain the skills levels of the Fiji military and also have access to equipment that they needed for peacekeeping missions. We saw Fiji sign Memoranda of Understanding on military cooperation with China, with Russia, with the United Arab Emirates and with Brazil. Now the links between these states and Fiji on the military front are not yet as beneficial as the cooperation between, with Australia and New Zealand, but they nevertheless introduce new and not entirely predictable elements to the regional security debate. Uh, Hugh mentioned before the, the Australian approach. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, on Australia, the history of that, but um, focus on what the, the new government has done. Uh, when the coalition government came to power here, uh, Foreign Minister Julie Bishop was concerned about the long-term implications of the decline of the bilateral relationship. Um, in early 2014, she travelled to Fiji, met with Prime Minister Bainarama and announced she was normalising relations with Fiji. This included new assistance for elections, uh, promise of a resumption of the Defence Corporation Program and other such rewards following the elections. She also announced a review of the travel restrictions policy um, and then a couple of months later lifted all, all travel restrictions in, Mar I think it was in March last year. I believe this helped Australia leverage an early restoration of a better relationship after the elections and I think it was a wise move for her to, um, to go up before the elections and, and um, renegotiate the relationship. Following the elections, the Minister praised the process, um, whilst importantly noting that more work needed to be done on consolidating democracy in Fiji. She was very quick to visit, um, travelled to Suva a month later, and announced a further range of measures to restore the bilateral relationship. <coughs> Diplomatic and military ties have now been restored, um, including with the appointment of Australian High Commissioner Margaret Toomey. Other governments, uh, like-minded governments to Australia, have also been complementary to the election process and have sought to restore um, full diplomatic relations of their own. But despite the renewal of, of all these ties um, with traditional partners, Bainarama is definitely committed to maintaining and strengthening the ties that he developed with non-traditional diplomatic partners after the coup. For instance, in the immediate post-election months, um, Prime Minister has hosted several high-profile visitors. Um, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi um, were in Fiji in the same week, uh, where Bainarama hosted also um, leaders in the region um, to meet both the Chinese and Indian leaders. The Russian Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs um, also visited Fiji in February 2015, so there's still a lot of activity on that front. Back to the Forum and the Commonwealth, um, Fiji suspensions from both organisations have been lifted by both organisations, but <coughs> Fiji has not yet formally rejoined, um, and there are questions as to what, uh, when and how that will happen. The Fiji government has been publicly ambivalent about rejoining both. Foreign Minister Kumbumbola has controversially suggested Fiji would not rejoin the Pacific Islands Forum while Australia and New Zealand remained full members suggesting instead that they could become development partners under a new membership format. This issue hasn't yet been discussed um, properly within the forum um, or indeed between, um, between leaders. Uh, a leaders meeting that was meant to be held in Sydney in the last month has, has not gone ahead um, and may be held in a different form later on. Fiji is certainly earnestly pursuing reform um, in the Pacific that will align with its ambitions. Um, 
it wants to reassert regional leadership um, and has done that through a variety of methods, but is meeting with some resistance from Papua New Guinea. The relationship between Prime Minister Bainarama and um, PNG Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has been somewhat less than friendly, with O'Neill choosing to visit New Zealand instead of attending Bainarama's inaugural Pacific Islands Development Forum meeting back in August 2013 and appearing to make life a little bit difficult for Fijian investment in, in Papua New Guinea for a time. Now the last decade has seen Fiji quite aggressively pursue an agenda of promoting itself as the natural leader of Pacific Island states, um, including in representing and championing Pacific Island interests in the United Nations. Um, and this has occurred at the same time as Papua New Guinea has had ambitions to, to claim that position and certainly been working towards that um, commensurate with its fast growing economy. As Fiji negotiates its relationships with multiple regional and international diplomatic arenas, um, the Prime Minister Bainarama is certainly likely to continue to promote the Pacific Islands Development Forum, otherwise known as PIDF, um, a regional organisation that doesn't include Australia or New Zealand and is designed to be a forum where government, civil society and business can talk about sustainable development cooperation. It has backing from China, financial backing from China and Russia and a number of other of Fiji's non-traditional partners. Um, there are some doubts in the region about the usefulness of the PDIDF, but it is still quite a young organisation, only two meetings so far, um, and Fiji does have ambitions to grow it. And I think um, it's not something, even if other countries have doubts about it, that Fiji is going to be willing to give up um, too soon because it, is in, it was an important initiative um, by which Bainarama was claiming its regional leadership. Australia and other Pacific Island countries um, are very keen to see Fiji return to the regional fold, and by this I mean the Pacific Islands Forum, um, particularly because it's, uh, Fiji is a big country in the region, um, it has a lot of capacity in its public service, it, it is really important to bring it into regional trade initiatives, regional security initiatives with such a big military. But the world of 2015 is much changed from the world of 2006. Fiji has demonstrated it can successfully pursue an independent foreign policy in a world in which China, Russia and emerging economies in Asia and elsewhere are more powerful. A world in which it is no longer necessary for a country's most important economic partner to also be <coughs> its most important strategic partner. Prime Minister Bainarama is likely to pursue a foreign policy which capitalises on its thawing relationships between, with Australia and New Zealand and at the same time maintain a strategic independence from the Australia-United States-centric regional order. This may have broader ramifications for the region if Fiji is recognised um, by other countries in the region as a regional leader outside the regional framework and if it continues to champion Pacific Island issues successfully internationally. The reinstatement of membership within the Commonwealth of Nations also remains a vexed issue. Um, Foreign Minister Kumbumbola has only intimated that the Fijian government was considering how to implement the lifting of the Commonwealth suspension, at least in public. With the restoration of democracy, a strong tradition of leadership within the Pacific Island states and deepening links with non-traditional diplomatic partners, Fiji has been very keen to carve out a new international identity for itself one which has been inevitably altered by the coup and one which may not include the Commonwealth in its future. The uh, announcement just last month that Fiji would be changing its flag and removing the Union Jack could be an indication that Bainarama is not in a big rush to rejoin the Commonwealth fold. After, if, you if you haven't heard about this, after a competitive design process, a new flag will be unveiled in October, which will mark the 45th anniversary, of course, of Fiji's independence um, from the United Kingdom and is meant to represent a strong sense of complete political and cultural independence from Fiji's colonial past. Adding to the complexity of this new era of Fiji's geopolitical self-evaluation is the changing economic um, conditions in Fiji. We've seen a, a, a long period of um, not much growth um, in Fiji since the coup, but um, certainly things seem to be picking up now. Fiji continues to change face many of the same challenges shared by other Pacific Island states, natural disasters, including possibly one this week, um, high transport costs, geographical isolation, um, and so economic growth is, is always going to be a struggle for, um, for a country like Fiji. However, um, since the elections there is a, a lot more confidence, um, but this year the World Bank is forecasting a GDP growth rate of 3.6%. 
Um, the economy has been showing signs of recovery um, and the Prime Minister's focus on increasing uh, foreign investment and enhancing infrastructure um, may well usher in an era of more consistent economic growth. Fiji's economic relationship with Australia will continue to be important, um, whatever happens on the, on, on the diplomatic front, um, because of our geographic proximity. Fiji has charted a course over the last decade involving a definitive shift away from traditional partnerships and has established a bold regional identity with the Pacific, which clearly marks the state as a diplomatic force to be reckoned with globally. The Fiji government appears to be well in control of managing this agenda internationally, but I think it may find regional challenges a little bit more complex to deal with than it is anticipated. The antipathy between Fiji and Papua New Guinea will not be easily resolved. Um, we've seen recent protests in Suva um, expressing solidarity with the suffering of the West Papuan people. Um, it slightly amused me that uh, this should be the first protest um, post-elections in a country where there were no protests about Fiji's own democracy in eight years. Um, so perhaps signifying how important uh, this issue has become in Fiji. Um, coinciding, of course, with the public expression of concern from Papua New Guinea Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, also about human rights in West Papua, have raised the profile of the West Papuan issue um, in the region. So it'll be interesting to see how the Fiji government responds to, uh, responds to this new situation and how it responds to West Papua's formal membership application to join the Melanesian Spearhead Group. While leadership on this issue uh, would be a very effective way for Fiji to, to build its popularity and solidarity um, within Melanesian states, it may have significant ramifications for Fiji's interest in strengthening its relationship with Indonesia, which is also, of course, important. It is very clearly in Australia's interest to have a good relationship with Fiji. I think it is also important to acknowledge Fiji's independent interests in a different world that we are facing today and indeed acknowledge the leadership capacity of Fiji in the region. Um, Fiji has certainly been prominent in promoting Pacific Island concerns internationally um, and does seem to have a, have a very good understanding of the, of the biggest challenges facing the region. I think we should also try and find a way to bring Fiji back to the Pacific Islands Forum um, without upsetting the ambitions of our close partner, Papua New Guinea. Julie Bishop, who has personally done much to improve the bilateral relationship, has an even more complex task ahead of her to manage this process and maintain support for Australia's role and Australia's leadership in the region. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny, for that uh, fascinating um, coverage of so many dimensions of what's happening in the South Pacific and particularly in and through uh, Fiji. We're opening, opening now for questions. We've got uh, some, um, some time for questions and I invite you to uh, address them directly to Jenny. Could I, could I actually kick it off by, I see Satendra Nandan sitting over here, Professor Satendra Nandan, who was part of that uh, constitutional a group put together by the Bainamarama government under Professor Yash Guy to produce the first constitution which was then thrown out. I wonder, I wonder, do you have any sort of comments on subsequent constitutional developments, just very briefly? Thank you, and thank you, Jenny. Uh, <clears throat> the principles on which uh, the constitution was to be crafted by... Perhaps Yash you could stand up. I think that people might have a chance of hearing you. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Tendry. Um, I'm surprised that Jenny did not mention that in the principles on which the constitution was to be crafted by Yash Kai and his team, there were five members, so including him. Some very important issues, there were ten basic principles, common name, secular state, one person, one vote, value. These were never in part of Fiji constitution. This is the first time that these principles were put in. And I'm very pleased to say that even the present constitution, the authorized version of Brady Moranis, uh, it was not, uh, the guy constitution was not thrown out. I think what really happened was it was a bit of a mistake that a little picture of burning of the scraps was shown all over the world in the constitution was being built. There was nothing like that. And I think, uh, as you know, to me, it was very powerful. And uh, it was used in a very negative way. But what they did do was, instead of following the process that were um, prescribed in the two decrees, 
which I believe were really drafted by Professor Carr, who was working. And then, of course, when he did not uh, accede to certain things that have been, uh, for example, the appointment of Shonemarai uh, as a consultant, really upset by him, uh, like, because he was part of the delegation to have a different kind of vision for Fiji. So I think that led to uh, great difficulty and bitterness between the Attorney General and the Chair of the Constitutional Commission. And uh, of course, Benny Marama listened to his Attorney General and they're very close together. And they had an agenda, a very strong agenda to move Fiji forward from its racial, communal, uh, electoral system. I remember that in 1990, when Rabuka had his electoral apartheid constitution imposed on Fiji, and it was a terrible constitution. We invited him here uh, to Canberra and gave him 21 again salute. And I think this time we invited Ben Yama and gave him at least 19 again salute. <laughs> 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 lead to some kind of foe in our relationship. But the more important thing, I mean, I can talk on the Constitution, the process was very open. We had uh, well, 7,000 submissions, some from two pages, 280 pages. We went to every part of Fiji, it was very open and well covered. In fact, we overdid it, I think. But the, the, the point that Ben Marama made recently in Geneva, which I think should be taken by Australia, because as Jenny says rightly, that Australia is the most important country for Fiji. It will remain so, because not only because of our historical ties in the neighborhood, but because most of the Fiji people are now the diaspora in New Zealand and Australia. And Australia has to play a much more magnanimous and generous role rather than <coughs> thinking of Benny Marama as a real villain. Yeah. But the point that Jenny did not mention, which surprised me, was that he mentions two things recently in, in, in Geneva. So the Hero Congress Commission. One was the asylum seeker problem, which is brutalizing many parts of the South Pacific. And the second was the climate change. And I think in both these very important issues of the Pacific, uh, Australia is uh, laying far behind what I would consider to be a major power and a major enlightenment. I wonder if Jenny would like to respond sure. to that. Uh, Thank you. Well, thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Satendra. Um, the reason I didn't go too much into the Constitutional Commission was I was really trying to look at the, the foreign policy agenda, but thank you very much for that information. It's um, certainly valuable. And as I said, the Constitution is, is a great document, and I think you know, it hopefully will, will be a lasting one for Fiji. Um, I also didn't mention the Human Rights Commission speech um, from Banyarama because I was saving it for Q&A and I, would, I hoped I'd get a question on it. I always do this with my speeches. I leave a little bit for, for questions so that I've got something else to say. Um, I agree that um, Australia is challenged on these issues. Um, of course, I don't speak for the government, but um, I think certainly Pacific Island countries are well within their rights to criticise Australia. Um, both on, on the asylum seeker policy, which of course has a huge impact on, on Papua New Guinea um, and on Nauru, um, but also on climate change. Um, this is of course an existential threat for many Pacific Island country states and certainly the smaller ones. Um, and, and a really huge issue for the region. And I think we, Australia does itself a disservice by not paying attention um, to the issues that are most important to island states internationally. Um, so, and I, as I pointed out, I think I think that's where Fiji has had success, certainly in championing, championing um, the very serious needs of Pacific Island states in terms of dealing with climate change in the United Nations and other forums. And I think this is where Fiji will continue to have success if it, if it differentiates itself from the Australian approach. And of course, is a Pacific Island state itself and, and has these, uh, is battling with the implications of climate change itself. Thank you. A, uh, there was a question over here, I think. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. I just had a quick question about, I guess, the distinction, or can we see a distinction between the Fijian government and Fanny Marama? And I guess, where do we, where do we go forward from here? Are we going to see a continuation of Fanny Marama's vision for Fiji, or is this going to be continued on in the Fijian government if there is a post Fanny Marama period? Okay. Um, I wrote a paper just before the elections last year in which I expressed fears about uh, Bainarama continuing to govern in an autocratic or authoritarian fashion, even though he was a democratically elected Prime Minister. Um, 
it, I've been thinking a lot about that in the last few weeks, whether I continue to be worried about it. Um, I think I do in the, in the longer term, but I am seeing things that make me hopeful. Um, firstly, uh, the parliament is functioning well. Um, there is a you know, there are committee processes. Um, Parliamentary to ten parliament. Um, the opposition has has a voice. Um, there are good people in the opposition, um, and the government. Even though uh, you could argue that, and certainly I probably would, uh, that Bainarama and his attorney general continue to have a lot of power. Um, other ministers are doing their job, um, and I think over time uh, that sort of confidence um, in the jobs that other parts of the government do will grow um, as they get more opportunities to, to interact. Um, I think the parliament itself will improve over time as well. And that, so um, I, I don't want to rush to judgment and saying it, you know, it, it will all be as it was before, um, because I do think we have functioning institutions. Of course, there's room for a lot of improvement, certainly on uh, uh, the issue of freedom of media. I think there's a lot, a lot more that can be done there. But I think we should also give Fiji some time. Um, it is in a period of transition still, and I think there's still a lot um, that they can achieve. Um, over the next few years. Thank you. Um, are you asking a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technical problem. <laughs> AWIA Council Member. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the aid that's coming from, from Russia, aid and investment from Russia and China. And I'm just wondering how we should view it, um, thinking in, in terms of Russia, what they're investing in and, and what it means for uh, geopolitical relations and with China. Uh, in terms of whether they're exiting bank loans or development bank loans, are the loans getting cancelled, are they being paid back, uh, there is, is there a lot of private money coming in, and what does it mean for the uh, strategic relations in the region? Um, in the case of China, there's quite a lot going on. Different, there are certainly um, exim bank loans there, there are development bank loans, there are straight out grants, there's um, a variety of activity across a number of sectors. Um, I guess most prominently in infrastructure, um, in roads and um, housing projects, um, things like that. But they are important because they're very visible um, and so the, the image of, of China helping Fiji on those important um, development projects is, is quite strong. Um, I, I actually don't think um, there's reason to be concerned about, about China's geopolitical influence. Um, even though we are seeing China provide more assistance to the Fiji military, um, I don't see that as, as a threat to Australian interests there, or, or certainly I don't see China trying to carve off a, a Fijian alliance from the rest of the region. Um, I think it's genuinely interested in Fiji being a, a prosperous country that it can invest in um, and do well out of. Um, the Fiji government's also proved itself to be uh, a little bit more adept in dealing with the Chinese over the past few years. Some, some people here might be aware that Chinese um, investment and, and aid to the region has been a somewhat controversial issue and, and some governments handle it better than others. Um, I think Fiji is moving into the handling it better than others camp in terms of getting maximum benefits for Fijian citizens, jobs for Fijians and, and the, sort of the ultimate benefit of the infrastructure build. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably confident that that um, Although, of course, an issue of strategic, ultimate strategic concern for Australia and the Chinese influence is increasing, I, I don't think we should be concerned at this stage. Um, on Russia, I'm, I'm less sure, only because it's not very clear um, where the investment is there. As I mentioned, I've quite a few MOUs in, in different fields, in health, education, um, on visa-free status, issues like that. And there, there just to be quite a lot of meetings, high-level meetings between the two countries. Um, so I'm just, we're not really sure what Russia's interests are. China's are, are more obvious um, and have been in the region for, for some years and I'm just I'm not seeing what Russia's interests really are in the long term. Good, there's a question here. Here, just a minute here. No? No, uh, partly been covered. Okay. Um, I, I do have another part to it, I'll come Please. to that later. Please, okay, over here, yeah. Um, what role are you to talk about before the elections that Barney Marama dominated the media? That's that change. And what role, if any, does the internet play in future politics and affairs? Uh, does Barney Marama continue to dominate the media? Uh, probably. <laughs> um, 
but in part he is the Prime Minister and one would expect a Prime Minister and a, a new government um, to dominate the media. Um, but I did say I was concerned about media freedom and I am. Um, I think the Fiji government has a pretty long way to go on understanding um, the value of a free media um, and learning how to interact and make the best use of of its media. Um, I still think there's, there's an inclination to, to control the media rather than engage with it, um, which worries me. But again, over time, um, I think that might change. The, an important issue is the issue of capacity in the Fiji media. I mean, having been censored or and then not censored but not given much freedom in the last few years, um, the just the straight out ability of Fijian journalists to, to do their job um, is questionable, not because they don't have the skills, but because they haven't exercised those skills in so many years. And there is still talk, um, many journalists, in, of self-censoring a little or being careful about, about what they produce or check in before they, before they write. Um, so I think there's, there's still some way to go there. Um, on the internet, it's a little... It, the internet in Fiji confuses me. Um, I would have thought over the years of between the coup and and now that there would have been a lot more discussion, um, perhaps on social media forums, um, about the elections and democracy in general. We saw a bit of increased activity in the lead up to the elections, but not as much as I would have expected. Not not as much as goes on in Papua New Guinea, for example. Um, so I'm not sure whether that it certainly doesn't represent the take up of the the internet in Fiji, which is actually higher than most other Pacific countries. So although still low um, compared to Australia, of course. Um, and I, I think that may have been a, a hangover from a period where uh, Fijians felt they were not able to express their views publicly and, and were a bit concerned that about who was watching them. So hopefully over time that that will change as well. Did I see another hand over here, Bill? Uh, I wonder if you could comment on um, attitudes towards the rather vexed question of compulsory voting in Fiji, which has been the source of, of quite a lot of uh, foolishness in my opinion in the past. Um, is it likely to become embedded once again in, in Fiji's ideas, or some Fijians' ideas about how a proper democracy should function, and is it a fact that malevolent advice on that, and I call it malevolent advice on that, comes from Australia and particularly from the left wing in Australia? It's a level of detail, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with, <laughs> and I'm going to turn to any other experts in the room and that's Satendra who, who may know more about that, that factor than I do. That's a really good question. Compulsory voting and whether Australia is seeking to influence oh, Fijian attitudes on compulsory voting. Compulsory voting in Fiji never was. And I think uh, the, the multinational youth observe the election led by Mr. Peter Wood, one of our very distinguished politicians here. He gave it uh, almost 99.9 percent. That was fair, free election. I don't think compulsory voting should be introduced in Fiji uh, because of the nature of the electorate. And for the first time in Fiji, uh, the elections were held on a single day. That itself was quite an, quite an organisation. And the turnout was quite high. Really high. Eighty-three percent. I think. Well, 67, 68. Percent. I think it was over 80 actually. So what? Uh, sorry. 80 percent. Yeah. So Bill, what Bill is saying is that there are moves, there are attempts to introduce compulsory voting. There always have been in Fiji, and a lot of it has come from the Australian okay. left. But no, it doesn't. There's no compulsory voting at the moment. Not at the moment. Yeah, but I'm not, okay, I'm not aware of it. Okay, good. Um, aware of other questions? Jenny, yeah, do, you, <laughs> um, do you think that uh, the election has definitively turned the page on it, communal tensions or the separation of communities, which was so much a feature of the constitution that uh, Bunyan uh, uh, wrote. David, as you know, being definitive about anything in our region is <laughs> dangerous. Um, but what I would say is that this result surprised me, um, certainly in, in that when I 
went and talked to the various parties before the elections, Sadopa was very confident of the victory um, because they felt that Fijians would vote the way they always had, along ethnic clients. And I wondered at the time um, whether that, that would hold true, given Bainarama had done so much work to, uh, I guess, appeal to a, a pan-ethnic divide there. Um, and I, I think his success, it's difficult to tell whether people have uh, genuinely voting um, as Fijians and rather than along ethnic lines, or whether they voted because they thought Fiji first and Bainarama was the best um, party and the best leader to continue the, the reforms that that they, they claimed were um, important um, or that they felt um, it would such a result would deliver stability. Um, so I wouldn't like to say it's definitely changed until we see the results of the next election. I think that would be the real test. But certainly the fact that younger people were, um, I guess, not talking as much about, about ethnic issues um, in pre-election discussions may have been an indication that things are changing. Of course, younger people are going to be the majority in, in the future. So I, th I think things are, are changing. Well, I wonder if uh, Candy Jenner, who keeps his ear to the ground very closely on this, and yeah. as president of the RCS, have you got any reflections on that, just very briefly? Or you, well, you I don't have, have, have any you? reflections, but uh, listening to, to our speaker made me think uh, about Fiji from pre-87, when the coup took place, post-87, when Baini Marama took over, from 87 to 2006, and post Baini Marama. Now, what are the main differences that you see on which your observations have been made in your talk today. I mean, po the, red, the time we're in now, what, what's the difference right, from yes. the past? Yeah, pre-87, between 87 and 2006, and post-2006. It's a quite a complex question. <laughs> it is a complex <laughs> question, but it's a complex <laughs> question that goes in the minds of people from Fiji all the time. <clears throat> what are the changes, the main changes that the world outside of Fiji sees? I think there are two main issues here. I mean, one, one is definitely what's happening from what Fiji looks out on when it looks out on the world, but also what, what happens in, internally and what drives um, people to vote, what drove people to vote along ethnic lines in the past and what drove them to do so differently this time. Um, and I, I don't think it's simply a matter of Bainarama saying everybody's Fiji and now um, and everyone has a Fiji and a common identity and we're all one and there's pieces broken out all over and there's no longer any racism or racial attitudes um, in any uh, sort of public service agency or anything like that. Um, I think certainly he can point to improvements. He's done a lot, a lot of work, certainly in the constitution um, and various efforts that Satendra himself has been involved in to, to change change that attitude. Um, I guess that the older generation of Fiji, Indo-Fijians and Itaka Fijians I talk to are, are sceptical about whether that change can be complete um, or whether it is a, kind of a, a political move on behalf of the Prime Minister in order to um, achieve a sort of long-lasting time in government for himself. Um, but then I talk to young people who, who say, look, race is just not an issue for us anymore. It's not something we think about when we, when we vote or we think about even on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, now, of course, that little straw poll of mine doesn't say anything about the, the whole country, but um, we, did, we actually did an opinion poll in Fiji in 2011, um, and um, as with all opinion polls in Fiji, we did um, the polling company that did it for us um, told us how many Indo-Fijians voted for various issues and uh, said, you know, yes or no or whatever on various issues and how many Itakai. And in that one, there was not a whole lot of difference on, on really any issue that I can recall, um, except one, I think, might have been the involvement of the military in Fiji politics. So there were more Indo-Fijians who thought that was important um, for stability. That's the only question in, in, in a lot of questions that, that we are. So I think, I think the Fiji of today is a different one. Um, but of course, I'm Australian. I, I don't live in Fiji and I'm not Fijian, so I don't want to speak for Fiji. But certainly from the outside, it does appear to be, there do appear to be different community attitudes. So. We have time for one more question, this gentleman here. 
<clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, Jenny, I think you answered it, the uh, question um, you know, in a very good way. We'll have to see uh, the next uh, elections, the results. It's, it's going to take quite a while. While we want that to happen, uh, I think there are different, uh, they're, they're very intact uh, ways of looking at things among our older generation that will take time. My question I want to come into is, uh, is about the role of the army, the military. You mentioned that it's definitely one of the biggest in the region. Mm -hmm. I suspect it's one of the biggest in the world in terms of per capita. Per capita. And, uh, <laughs> and it's interesting when you mentioned that the first protest in Suva was against our brothers and sisters in West Papua. And uh, the virtual absence of it during the eight years or so of uh, the military government it's a massive number, it's a massive force, and it's, um, and it's been a source of you know, our insecurity uh, since Mbarwanda's uh, Prime Ministership in 1987. And if you look back, uh, since Mbarwanda was elected into a leader, uh, every other leader or every other election that followed, more or less followed the military coup. Mm -hmm. We've never really had uh, you know, a nice, gentle time of developing mm -hmm. our uh, select committees of parliamentary democracy of developing, uh, you know, before we come into it. has to be strong. We've got to do a coup because we have a military, it's a very powerful military, it's in your face. Um, the question for me is uh, you know, whether it's currency within Australia's involvement or even now how apt it is within the Commonwealth. Uh, my view is that um, you know, unless we take the military out, Completely, um, there's not going to be any stability or long-term stability in Fiji. Okay. Today, there are certain groups of our people are saying, "Brilliant, we've done it," because they agree with Mayor Morale. Not so long ago, in 1987, indigenous ethnic Fijians were saying, "Brilliant, we've done it. We've recaptured yeah. the essence sure. that we made." It. The British, uh, Fiji sorry, the, Ami, the sorry, question Indian Ami is, yeah. is a very long tradition with, yeah. the, with the British Army. Here, what is the possibility of getting Fiji and Army, those who want to continue Korea in military, that Australia, New Zealand, and Britain have got that? You mean to serve, serve in the Australian military? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a massive cost of anger, of pain, and it's going to go on. Continue. Thank you. So what's, what's your <laughs> reflections on that? Um, that's not the first time I've heard that, that suggestion. It's not one that, that I've made, but it's certainly that uh, some other think tank colleagues of mine have made. Um, I, I don't really see a, a problem with it in terms of being, being useful for the Australian military, um, certainly to bring um, our Fijian recruits here, but I, I don't think it actually solves your concerns or public concerns in Fiji about the military's long-term role in politics and the propensity of the military to be able to change the political leadership when it wants to, um, unless you completely get rid of the military in Fiji. So I don't think you can just keep extracting people from the Fiji military and hope that that means they won't be interested in politics at home. There'll always be someone interested in politics at home. Um, and I think in terms of the military stature in Fiji society, the the value to international prestige of Fijian peacekeeping troops, I think it's a very difficult prospect for any country to be suggesting <laughs> that, that Fiji needs to downsize its military or or mute the, the voice of, of military in, in Fiji society or uh, mm -hmm. sideline the military. Um, so I really don't know what the answer is there. I, I tend to sympathise with you that, yes, it's going to be a problem forever. Um, in Fiji, as, as long as the military thinks it's the interests, it's the protector of Fiji, um, which it does tend to think it is. Um, and while it, it continues to, to feel that, it will continue to, to have an interest in what happens on the political scene, beyond perhaps the lifespan of Prime Minister Banarama. Well, look, thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I've been given three, three minutes. To, to make closing remarks, and I just want to make three points as simply as points. Uh, we've, we've seen um, Fiji and the Pacific as a country and a region of dramatic change. And um, the first point I want to make is the key question that was raised, does Fiji need Australia? And I think we've seen over recent years a move away from 
uh, any dependence, deliberately on the part of Prime Minister Bainarama, any dependence on even the suggestion that Australia is needed in Fiji. And so a lot of our traditional approaches have got to change. Um, I'm looking at purely from a diplomatic point of view of how we approach Fiji and the region. You know, those fl flagship items we've always been, um, been uh, we've worked away at aid and trade and defence liaison and um, uh, are going to be equally important. But um, um, more importantly, I guess, we always saw ourselves as uh, cooperating to try and shape shape the, the region and shape the responses and be helpful in supporting and um, uh, building up where we thought was necessary. And, um, uh, and it seems to me that a new form of Australian leadership is going to be required. And back in my day in Fiji, which goes back to the Dark Ages now, John Trott is even more recent than I am, um, <laughs> well, it is uh, what we used to say, you know, lead, the, uh, leading from behind. And um, we used to say to ministers sitting in meetings in the South Pacific, you know, don't be out there with uh, all your suggestions about how this meeting should be shaped. Sit back and wait for them and then we can see where Australia might have a role. And I got to feel more and more that Australia's role, adapting to this change and uh, responding to the question, does Fiji need Australia, might demand certain new responses about our approach. The second thing that's amazed me uh, in recent years has been the, the way the region has changed as well. Um, you do have a sort of much more bellicose region in the sense that Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, they're all prepared to go along with Fiji on some things but stand up to them on others, like the Melanesian Spearhead Group or like the PIDF. You know, they're, they aren't, uh, I mean, Fiji's moved ahead with great determination on these things to, 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 to take a leadership role. But it hasn't always been unanimous and it hasn't always, always been uh, a peaceful um, or, or a passive reaction on the part of the other island states to what their, whether Fiji perceives their needs correctly. And so I think that new, that new, um, um, I think Fiji's change has wrought a certain um, maturity in some of the responses of the regions and individual states. And then lastly, one of the issues that in the Commonwealth context and in the Australian interest uh, uh, context we've followed in recent years has been the importance of small states in the, in, in, in the uh, international community. And in the Commonwealth, you know, 54 states or 53 or whatever, uh, a huge proportion of them are small states under a million, some, a lot of them small island states. And since the invasion of Grenada in, 1980s, uh, in the early 1980s, and the Commonwealth role in pursuing the vulnerability of small states and what might be done about that, there's been a great resurgence in the international community recognising that this is a problem. And in New York, for example, you have that grouping of um, small states that's now very important. They're seen as wielding influence. The Grenada example showed how a small state could throw a large powerful nation like the United States off course and um, cause all sorts of ruptures between the UK and Europe and the United States. Uh, and um, I think Fiji probably um, mastered the political dynamics of the small state situation in a very impressive way, um, both in the region and in New York. I mean, Peter Thompson in New York is really one of the most uh, prominent of the ambassadors there who's been pushing this now for, for four or five years. And so there is change taking place and I think it does demand change on the part of Australia in act actually the way we perceive the region. Jenny, thank you very much. I know uh, Cameron's going to thank you, but from the point of view of this joint, um, this joint uh, meeting here at lunchtime, the Commonwealth Roundtable, I'm very grateful for your insights today, so thank you very much. Well, thank you.